In the group that consumed a thousand extra calories of sugar, 98% of the fat that was accumulated was from de novo lipogenesis. That means that the fat was new, newly developed. But what happened when they overconsumed a thousand calories of seed oils or a thousand calories of saturated fat? It's pretty wild. And from this study, we learn when the best time to have saturated fat is and maybe when the best time to not is. It's actually a helpful study. Let's break it down. After today's video, I put a link down below for the first thing that I've seen of this kind. It is literally a red light blanket. Like if you go to a, a tanning salon or something, you're gonna pay like $100 to go sit in a red light bed. Most of the evidence that's out there with red light therapy is like when you are covering almost your entire body. That's ridiculous to go spend that to sit in a red light therapy bed. This is the first thing that I've seen. It's from Bond Charge, and that is a 15% off discount link. It's literally a blanket that you can slide in like a sleeping bag with true 660 nanometer wavelength red light. So if you're looking at recovery, you're looking at mitochondrial health, you're looking at all the different things that red light is legit for, this isn't pseudoscience, this is real stuff. Like a lot of NFL teams, MLB, NHL, they all use this stuff. Military, they're using red light. And this blanket makes it so that it's portable, so that it's super compact and it stores, but you're getting the full body effect that you really, really want. So that link, 15% off a red light therapy blanket from Bond Charge. So this study was published in Diabetes Care. And at first glance, it sounds kind of negative but it actually just illuminates a lot. And the only thing that it's potentially negative towards, to be fully frank with you, is sugar. Even though on the surface, it makes it sound like saturated fat could be really, really bad. I'll go ahead and kind of give you a little bit of a spoiler alert. Saturated fat is problematic if you're over consuming calories. Then saturated fat kind of goes from here to like whoop, way off the charts problematic when you are over consuming other things especially hyperpalatable processed carbohydrates, realistically. So let's take a look at this study. So what they did is they took 38 participants and they overfed them 1,000 calories from either saturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, actually just unsaturated fat, so a mix of poly and monounsaturated fats, or 1,000 calories from sugar. So three different sets, right? Here's what's wild. The saturated fat group ended up having an increase of 55% in their intrahepatic triglycerides. So their liver fat went up 55%. That is sketch. And I've actually referenced this study before because when we're talking about like overconsumption of food, like overconsuming saturated fat is not good. Like overconsuming it when you're already consuming a bunch of carbohydrates, standard American diet, and then you add a bunch of like additional saturated fat on top of it, that's not good. That does lead to an increase in interhepatic triglycerides. That does lead to potential insulin resistance and higher circulating levels of insulin. Not many people are denying this, but where people are missing the boat is they're not looking at the nuance. Anyway, let's keep going. The sugar group, they ended up having a 33% increase in intrahepatic triglycerides in their liver fat, okay, which is a proxy for visceral fat also not good. I had Dr. Sean O'Meara on not that long ago. We really did a deep dive in that. Wild stuff. Anyway, 98% of the fat though, as I mentioned earlier, de novo lipogenesis, meaning it was new fat, new, brand new fat, okay? Meaning it converted sugar into fat through de novo lipogenesis. The polyunsaturated fat and monounsaturated fat, just the unsaturated fat group, actually surprisingly, it was only a 15% increase in hepatic triglycerides, only a 15% increase in overall liver fat. But without going into details too much on this video, other studies that show more long-term stuff show that high consumption of linoleic acid can lead to a higher oxidation of linoleic acid, which is in our subcutaneous tissue, potentially in cholesterol particles. Bottom line is longer term, overconsumption of polyunsaturated fats and linoleic acid is probably not the best either. But in the context here, we're really looking at saturated fat and understanding this. Here's what is super wild. Saturated fat can actually increase lipolysis. What does this mean? Well, it means that saturated fat encourages our adipose tissue to release fatty acids. What the downside is, is that in this overfeeding surplus state, 
These fats aren't just being mobilized from our adipose tissue and burned, they're being mobilized and redeposited into our liver. Only 26% of the saturated fat when overfed turned into de novo lipogenesis or new, new fat, right? 98% of the sugar turned into new fat. So if saturated fats increase lipolysis, then why aren't people getting leaner when they consume saturated fats? Well, there's twofold. Saturated fats in a metabolically healthy person, and a very important thing, an active person, may actually help improve this turnover. It may help. It is called fatty acid turnover or churn. We always have fats going in and out, right? Triglycerides will go into storage and then fats will be liberated. This happens all the time. Now, what's important is that we mobilize and then also oxidize. Okay, so with that, it doesn't mean that eating a stick of butter is, and then going for a run is gonna make you oxidize more fat or mobilize more fat. I mean, I guess in theory it kind of does, but at a certain point thermodynamics come into play. And if you ate a stick of butter, you probably had like over a thousand calories or something, right? So case in point, don't do that. What I'm trying to suggest is that when you are not overfeeding, particularly when you are in a deficit, there's some evidence that saturated fat in isolation, like in a deficit, could actually be very good for mitochondrial health and for metabolic just health and fatty acid oxidation and potentially even fat loss. It's not until you cross the threshold of overeating, particularly in the abundance of like hyperpalatable processed carbohydrates where it becomes a big issue. Now, if you look at sugar on the other hand or excess just refined carbohydrates, that's not really stimulating any kind of turnover or stimulating fatty acid like liberation or mobilization. All that's doing is leading to excess fat accumulation. Unless you have the ability to go oxidize and utilize those carbohydrates, then you're gonna be in kind of an interesting spot. And this video isn't even to bash carbohydrates. The point is, is carbohydrates, as I've talked to many, many, many qualified guests on this channel, like carbohydrates come down to being sort of an exogenous aid, right? They're not particularly best maybe to just live off of, like maybe protein and good balance of fats and carbs, but just adding carbs for carbs sake without activity probably isn't the best decision. And I think most reputable people in dietetics and nutrition would agree with me. But again, where we run into the issue is saturated fat seems to be most problematic in a surplus. And almost all the studies that look at saturated fat are in a surplus. It seems as though we might get additional benefit, and this is somewhat speculation, additional benefit if we're in a caloric deficit and we switch over to more healthy sources of saturated fat at that point because we potentially increase the lipolysis effect. We increase that turnover. So when you're trying to diet down and you're eating a little less food, that might be a good time to add some dairy fat in. It might be a good time to add a little cheese or some butter, or maybe eat that little bit of ribbon that's on that you know, cut of steak that you have, or eat the 93% lean ground beef instead of the 96% and just get some of that extra little fat, but don't go overboard because it's way too easy to get those calories out of control if you go overboard, right? If you choose a ribeye that has a ribbon of fat this thick on it and you eat that entire ribbon, I mean, you still gotta factor in that that's a lot of calories, even though it may not be the end all be all, it's still super important to factor that in overall. So this evidence tells us that yes, although excess saturated fat consumption can certainly lead to fatty liver and to insulin resistance, it's really only in the context of overeating and particularly in the context of overeating on a standard American diet. So if your diet is in check, you're in a caloric deficit, and most importantly, you are active, a nice balance of polyunsaturated fats saturated fats may be in a slight bit more than you ordinarily would as long as you're in a deficit, and you're probably gonna be in a good spot. And one more thing to note, just to play devil's advocate, is when you look at polyunsaturated fats, they are good, but they're designed to be consumed in their whole food form. Fish, maybe some nuts, maybe some seeds, I don't know a single person, actually I can probably think of some weirdos on Instagram that are probably beating the drum of oxidized linoleic acid being good for you somewhere, but that's not the point. The point is, is that no one's really denying that good, wholesome polyunsaturated fats are gonna be a big problem in small amounts. 
I think they actually have their merit. Look at the Mediterranean diet. Mediterranean diet largely has the best outcomes. When you look at BMI, when you look at longevity, when you look at all-cause mortality, diabetes, metabolic health, they're doing something right. But what they're not doing in the Mediterranean region is guzzling high oleic sunflower oil and soybean oil that's been sitting on the shelf for six months. I'll see you tomorrow.